well aware there's uh, the port access codes being reviewed at the moment. Um, so I guess we're waiting for that draft report to come out. I, you know, um, from a historical point of view, I think you know the code moved as uh, the port access code was a great improvement on the previous access undertakings we had. Um, are there still some inefficiencies in 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 that system? Um, yeah, I think you, you know, in personal view, is uh, is is yes. But I think that's a yeah, that's a that's a sort of a slightly different. Um, slightly different issue to, to what we've been talking about here. It's very much a domestic policy um, uh, issue. Um, in terms of the, the tit for tat, uh, look, I don't think so. I think the NTMs are really being developed by countries from around their own. Um, it's really been their own domestic policies that are really um, giving rise to some of those um, NTMs. So most of the NTMs that we deal with, uh, you can really translate back to a, either you know, a domestic support policy around protecting their, their, one of their domestic industries or concerns around food safety, environment. Um, you know, say sometimes the, the impl impl implementation of that policy is very legitimate. Sometimes it's maybe pests that are not. Um, I guess one of the creeps that we've seen is a little bit of emphasis on um, quality rather than pure quarantine issues. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think that, um, from, our, from a grains perspective, I don't think it's a, a, a tip for tap type issue. But the weeds might, from a broader, <laughs> from a broader perspective, the weeds might be able to answer. <laughs> oh look, um, the only thing I'd add is, um, you know, it's, it's we're always trying to work through um, with our particular trading partner, partner what the issues are, and try and find that way through sometimes a, a not particularly transparent sort of system. So it's really. Depending on the issue, depending on the country, um, we try and work with the industry to, to deal with the, the issue that's popped up. I'm uh, Bruce Muirhead from the University of Waterloo in um, Canada, and um, we just this is for Lee actually the question. Um, we've signed a free trade agreement with the Europeans, and geographical indications were one of the big sticking points early on in the game as well. And the Europeans play extremely hard ball when it comes to defending what their perceptions, of course, are, of uh, geographical indications. Are. And since we're in a sense a price taker, it was Canada that wanted the agreement with the Europeans as opposed to the other way around. I'm wondering if you have experienced, you're about two years into your negotiation now, I guess, with the, with the Europeans in terms of the free trade agreement you're trying to negotiate. So that gives you some sense about where you're going with this. Also, um, and have you experienced any blowback, I guess, from the Europeans in terms of the kinds of geographical indications you're keen on presenting or preserving in Australia? And also, Pernod um, Ricard is a French company. So, I mean, are you torn in a sense? Is the head office saying, no, 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 we don't care about that? We have a bigger, the European side of things is much more important. So I'm interested in the two things, if you've had any tough sledding yet with, uh, with geographical indications with respect to your particular industry, and uh, as well with your company, is um, uh, have you received any instructions, I guess, from head office as to what you're supposed to present and what right, you're not supposed to There's probably a lot of questions in there. So look, I'll answer the first one, which is around where are we up to with the EU FTA negotiations. Um, so again, we've done a scoping study, so we haven't started negotiations. Um, so that's, um, that journey still needs to be uh, had, and we're looking forward to that with our EU counterparts, which I know a few of them are in the room. Okay, and then there's a two other questions, I think, uh, I got out of that, which is, um, uh, around uh, what's happening in GIs um, and what that might mean um, in, you know, for Australia and, and, and the EU FTA. And I don't know whether you can answer the third one, but anyway, we'll give it a go. Lee? Well, yeah, I'll, give that, I'll give that one a go first up, actually, in terms of, no, I haven't received any specific instructions. So <laughs> there we go. Not, not that I'm aware of, and maybe I'll find out tomorrow or this afternoon. Um, <laughs> but uh, we're a global company. Uh, as you've seen, for example, we sell Jacobs Creek in 76 different countries. So yes, we have a European base, but we're, we're represented all over the world. Um, I think, um, as I said in my presentation, from a regional point of view, uh, as much as we would want to defend the Barossa Valley, for example, as a, as a GI, we also respect the, uh, the, the right of any other region to do so, and I think that's really important in, in those discussions. Um, I think where, as an Australian industry, we, we find it challenging, and the Winemakers Federation of Australia um, have, have, have defended well on this, is when those GI discussions start to involve uh, grape varieties um, uh, that you're already using as an industry or other terms. I think that's where the, the sticking points may well come. 
I'm not a legislative expert. I'm not a legal expert. But I think that's where, uh, as a region, and again, we are we, we, we own two champagne houses, Mum and Perrier-Jouette, and Champagne is Champagne, and, and they defend that well around the world, and we respect that too. So, uh, But I think it's when that, that GI discussion goes beyond the region, um, and particularly when we in Australia, we have, we, we're working with Prosecco, uh, as are lots of other producers, and not just the bigger producers, lots of small boutique producers, and if, as and as I said, if it carries on to Nero Davolo, Montepulciano, uh, and so on and so forth, other grapes, um, that's going to restrict innovation uh, and uh, and also affect businesses that are already invested quite heavily in the prosecco industry or other areas. So I think um, I think that's the, that's part of the challenge in the in the discussion. Uh, but I'll leave that to cleverer people than me to sort out. So. Okay. Um. Oh, just before I've got, we've got one question up there. Just before that, I just had a question for um, Don. Um, one, in your talk, you were talking about um, in the negotiations um, around the STEs, we concentrated on the exports and what export um, STEs. But I mean, what happened on the import side? Why, why did we not sort of talk through that as part of the negotiations? Before answering that question, could I say something that I should have said at, at the in my presentation? That was that there are one or two copies of the of a paper that is a background to to my slides. Should anyone want to to read the paper, I think it's available at reception. Oops, thank you. Thank you. Now to answer to answer your question, um, it's difficult to understand the minds of trade negotiators. But in reading, in reading the WTO documents that, that were floating around in, in 2000, it would seem that the US w was against STEs full stop. It didn't matter whether they were exporters or, or importers. I think, I think the Europeans were against exporting STEs. And Japan and Korea took the view that importing STEs didn't affect the world market. It affected only the domestic market which may or may not be true. It depends on whether you believe that Japan and Korea are large countries in the context of particular commodities. Um, I guess the argument that, that they put in their submissions won, won the day, or it perhaps was that the EU and, and, and others, and I mean, I think Australia and Canada would have probably kept a fairly low profile given the Australian Wheat Board and the Canadian Wheat Board at that, at that time were, were single desk exporters. So I think, uh, as I say, it's difficult to get in the minds, into the minds of, of trade negotiators to know really why importing STEs fell off the table and haven't been revisited since, given that for many large importing countries, uh, STEs are, are important, Kofco and Bullog and Japan Food Agency are, are all important traders in international markets for particular commodities, okay. and yet they're not being negotiated. Okay, thank you very much for that answer. I appreciate that. So I've got one up here, and then we'll go to the second. So. Jared Greenville from the OECD. Um, I just have a question regarding, I guess it prompted from the, the comment that you know, there's adverse consequences for trade, even if good regulatory motors exist behind. Um, but just then reconciling that also with Lee's presentation, so there's opportunities, there's also benefits, and some work that we've done that shows that there's both a positive quantity effect and, pr and price effect. So you can sell more sometimes at a higher price when some of these particularly SPS and TBT arrangements exist. Um, and I was interested that there wasn't really any comment from grain producers to say that there's no higher returns in markets because of some of these, these measures. Um, and so just to try and reconcile those two, are there anything about the processes in which countries use to develop these regulations, these NTMs at the domestic sense, that might create less costs? Um, are there things that they do when they make these things that make them less costly or, or enhance the benefits that are on offer? Um, so we can take a step back and then that might be a, a point in which the Australian government or other governments can talk about because you pointed to some good things about, you know, in the FTAs and case by case, but is there something more fundamental to that? Yeah, look, I think, you know, um, it's a very big topic and it's very complex. <laughs> I guess that's the issue. And, and um, I guess we were highlighting the, um, the, the, um, yeah, that, the, the trade restrictions and then the um, restrictions on access. 
But you're right, once we've negotiated access um, sometimes on those things and, and we've, we've become compliant, it actually can be quite beneficial. So um, the EU sustainability on canola, well, we've just got the tick off our greenhouse gas, a lot of great work by the government um, to help do that, and industry as well, industry you know, doing the work to put the, the data together and then the government negotiating that. Um, we've certainly now got a competitive advantage in, in that market and um, certainly Europe's been, you know, for canola has been the, you know, the highest returning, highest value market over the, the last period of time. So, and I guess, you know, to my point about the emerging challenges, if we can now use um, that set of rules for any other country that wants to bring in sustainability, then that's a, that can be a very cost effective expansion for the industry. If countries, there, but if other countries bring in um, sustainability rules that are different, and we have to go through, you know, another certification process and another auditing cost, then it becomes, uh, you know, uh, you know, a much greater greater cost. So, um, it's not. You're right. It's not. You know, it's not necessarily um, black black and white. Um, and look, there's certainly some uh, in some markets. There's you know, India's got some fumigation requirements, which allows us to compete in that market and, and rules out other competitors in that market. So it's, uh, um, but having said that, it, it's a bit more complex back here because not, not all of our um, exporters have that cap capability to do it. So it's a very, yeah, look, it's, it's a very complex issue. Um, but, you're, but I guess in essence, um, the NTMs do, impl do put extra costs and compliance and risks on the industry. But um, it can, there can be some benefits as well if, you, if we can end up, you know, if we can end up being compliant on those things. Yeah. Okay, I think um, the only other thing I'd add there is also um, I heard I saw on Rosemary's slides, and I know um, we're quite keen on continuing to do that, trying to make sure that we have those discussions in international forums about um, your point about you know which ones um, of your interest and can we look at seeing whether other trading partners are actually saying, yes, we'll, we'll adopt that particular system. So systems recognition, we call it, but it's, it could be MRLs, it could be you know, sustainability, it could be other things that um, are, are affecting our trade. That's right, and definitely to that. I mean, the, the whole standards, standards and testing harmonisation, I mean, that's something that, again, we're working strongly through the APEC um, system with, and if we could get that, that actually is a beneficial, to, it, lifts, yeah, it helps everyone, essentially. Okay, um, we've got a question in the middle there. Thank you. I'm Yamashitaev. I used to work for the Japanese government, the Ministry of Agriculture, Forests and Fisheries, and I took part in the Yurga Ran negotiation. So I would like to provide a, one answer to your question to the importing state <laughs> enterprise. Because some state of uh, STA benefits uh, benefit the, the exporting countries, some exporting countries. Because uh, Actually, you mentioned GATT Article 17. GATT, the scope of GATT Article 17 is not confined to the agricultural product. It's a, it's a good in general. But in the, in the, in the final session of the uh, drafting negotiation of the agreement on agriculture in the WTO, which, which I took part in, uh, took part in. and actually the, there is a paragraph two of Article 4 in the agreement on agriculture, which prohibit, which prohibits uh, non-tariff barriers, uh, such as uh, state-owned, uh, state-trade enterprise. If you if you read the footnote to the to the paragraph two of the article four, uh, state state-trade enterprise is clearly stipulated, and it is not it should not be, be maintained under the uh, WTO provisions, but. We succeeded in maintaining the state trade enterprise of Japan, especially food, food agency. That's because for, for more than 60 years, uh, we import, uh, we have imported wheat from the United States, Australia, and Canada. And the share of each country is very constant. 60% from the United States, 20% from Canada, 20% from Australia. So the United States and other, some other exporting countries were very complacent with the management of the state-owned uh, enterprise. So we clearly shut down imports from Russia or U European Union or U Ukraine. 
So the such kind of uh, practice yeah, was very, very satisfied the United States. So that's why, even though it is, it is not consistent with the current WTO provisions, we can succeed in maintaining the, the state-led enterprise. So that's why the United States would not like to take up the measure, to, uh, the issue in the Doha round negotiation. Thank you very much. So I appreciate that explanation. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you want to add anything else to that to Don. Uh, just... I think not. <laughs> <laughs> we can have a discussion afterwards, I think. Uh, so thank you very much. It was a good, good explanation for those that uh, weren't involved in that discussion.